Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back, Honors. Welcome back to y'all's virtual classroom for your last unit before the end of the year. <sighs> I know the seniors had their countdown, but our countdown is on now, right? So we are now going to be subject to about like four or five common flips that will be together, which will be detailing the following, the interwar years and World War II. We will be getting a crash course on these things. So we will not be dis necessarily flipping them in extreme depth. However, you will be doing some extreme depth assignments. My academic kids, y'all have your last test grade coming up this like two weeks where you're going to be doing a project that you can actually use for a test grade. So it will be based much more on your effort, your worksmanship, and your ability to create a product. And it can be something that does so well for y'all, but looking at the test grades rolling in right about now, a lot of y'all are doing much better on this World War I test than you did on the last one, so kudos on that. You guys are crushing it. Now, the honors girls, on the other hand, y'all are going to be completing a research paper where you are going to be discussing the rise of the totalitarian dictators. The same thing will be the premise for the project for the um, academic girls, but it will be less research-based essay. It will be much more along the lines of, you know, how they got there. Where'd they come from? These people like Mussolini and Schmittler, right? So anyway, let's go ahead and get into it because this flip could be a little on the long side. I hope it's not, but let's dive in, all right? I'm so excited to talk about this stuff because I have never been able to teach about these things in Western Civ. Chappelle happens to be the first school that I've ever taught about World War II at. So y'all are going to be able to come along with me on this journey through some stuff that I find to be some of the most interesting stuff out there. So let's go ahead and get into it. So we're talking about mainly first, we got it before we can get into World War II, a lot of history teachers in the past have probably just gone, World War I ended, and then there was some stuff, and then World War II, and they just like jump right in it. You can't do that. You really got to take time to analyze the reason why my hair is so jacked up. There we go. So you got to take some time to analyze those interwar years, right? What happened between the years of 19... Stop licking. Um, so, of... Uh, sorry, my dog just... Stop licking your feet. Quit it. You're going to hurt yourself. Yeah, make a sigh. Okay, anyway, sorry. So, the interwar years. This age of anxiety from 1920 to 1939. 1939 being the specific start. If you do not stop licking your feet, I'm going to come over there. And I'm going to squish your face. I'm going to be nice to you regardless. But still, stop licking your feet. All right, anyway, so 1939 being the beginning of World War II, okay? So World War II beginning, of course, in September of 1939 when the Nazis invade Poland. So let's go ahead and start off, though. You got to understand that this whole time was very intense, positively, negatively. It was a lot of different things. Why it's referred to sometimes as that age of anxiety, right? So for some... Notice I have that word SOME with a capital on there. For some, post-World War I was new and intense, was great, was awesome, because it was the roaring 20s. <sighs> like, I mean, it was legit. It was like nightclubs and big band music and all this money making and all this rise of consumerism. It was a great time for a lot of people. Now, the rise of the consumer economy particularly took place in a lot of the uh, uh, big three countries, your France, Britain, uh, United States, not Russia because they're communist now, but like a lot of other areas, right? Your first world areas are going to see a rise in consumerism and the consumer economy. You're going to see modern appliances have their birth. Like, look at this advertisement for a fridge. Look at this. This family's so happy. Look at that modern advertisement from... Whoever these people are, I swear if I got my wife a fridge as a gift, she would punch me in the face, all right? And her birthday actually is coming up in a couple days. So now, anyway, modern, I'm not going to do that. Cheap fashions are going to show up, textiles, right? Like these factories now post-industrial era, we are over 100 years removed from the Industrial Revolution. We are making cheap, nice fashions that anybody can afford. Personal care products are now going to be on sale. Night creams, lotions, soaps. Like, gah! Like, so travel and leisure. The auto industry is going to be booming. 
the electricity is going to be in almost every home, telephones being in almost every home, you've got money coming out the wazoo, right? A consumer economy has exploded. The consumer economy that you know of now, the one that has to do with the growth of modern families and the growth of the family home, the leave it to Beaver, leave it to Cleaver, suburb expansion, like understanding, get married, go off, have your two and a half kids with your nice car and do your thing up. So you got to understand like this consumer economy, this birth of consumerism is huge. And it's a massive element of these roaring 20s. And then you saw the liberation of the woman, the like middle class woman, but like I'm not getting into it right now. So we'll talk about that later. Now the new woman, right? This stereotypical image of the new modern woman, the modern independent working woman of the 1920s who could vote, right? So which was huge because as of the 1920s, most Western countries are officially allowing full suffrage for women as early as the 1920s, except for France and Italy, but we won't get into that right now. So anyway, now, you're going to see women going off to work. They're going to actually keep some of these jobs that they actually got while World War I was in action. Because while World War I was happening, who were the ones that entered into the factories? The women were the ones that entered into the factories to try and replace the jobs left behind by men in this total war, right? That war that was encompassing the economy, the like every aspect of the American and Western life was enveloped in that war. So women went off to help actually fight that war on an economic level so they could go off and work she was making her own money she spent her own money she even went out and smoked cigarettes right she smoked cigarettes she cut her hair she wore short dresses she did her thing right this is the new woman this new woman of the 1920s this image of the flapper that you have in your head right dancing the charleston doing her thing having a great time my hair is so long i cannot wait for quarantine to be over so i can get this noise cut all right it's ridiculous like look at this stuff it's just so long like look at that it's so long like, if I just put it in front of my face, this is not, like, this is so gross. All right, so anyway, ow, well, I heard just hurt my neck. Now, going into it, though, women were having a new liberation of their own, sort of. Uh, like, I mean, they just got the right to vote, like, five minutes ago. So we can't just, like, gloss over all of the women's rights infringements that have happened in history up to this point and be like, oh, it's okay now, because it's not. Um, like, things are still not equal, per se, but, you know, this new image of the liberated woman was coming to the forefront. And a lot of historians believe the reason why the women were given the right to the vote is because you kind of couldn't argue after they gave the economy the boost it needed during the war to keep functioning. So, and then you've got the rise of the cinema, the rise of the personal radio. Here are some, three examples, or two examples of some, one, some of my favorite 1920s movies. You've got right down here, oh, let me move myself over here. There we go. Uh, there they are. Look at these guys. Yep, I know those, I know a lot of y'all are about to like take a screenshot of one of those guys and send it to your friends and be like, look, Mr. Terry's talking about that movie you were in. That's really mean. Don't do that to Casey Heather Goodwin. Now, anyway, so this right here is Nosferatu, right? Nosferatu is the first cinema, first movie about Dracula. And then this guy, of course, right here, the scamp himself. Or the tramp. Is he the tramp or the scamp? I think he's the tramp. All right, so that's Charlie Chaplin. So the cinema had its birth. The modern cinema. The idea that you have uh, when you're thinking of going off to the movies on a weekend and seeing a film with friends, that idea was birthed in the 1920s as a part of this consumer economy. Throwing up really quick. An image of Charlie Chaplin doing his roller skating routine from the movie The Modern Times, which was actually produced, I believe, in 1928, all right? And this is a very cool stunt. It looks like he's coming to the edge of the, like, wall and everything like that, and it's got great music in the background. And so, you gotta understand that the cinema was exploding. Now, most of these movies were still silent, okay? So they had, like, audio maybe layered on top of them, but there wasn't any dialogue. You couldn't hear people talking to each other. Like, it wasn't as advanced as what we're doing right now with me talking to you. There's silent film still. So there was a lot of music, maybe some slight sound effects, and then, like, little patterns would pop up, and it would, like, tell you what they were saying in little brief things. There's a very famous one that I've watched all the way through when, when we had an assignment in college. It's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, so, and then you had the personal rise 
as the radio if you didn't. This is before the television set was inside of everyone's home. Before you were streaming Netflix, everybody sat down around the radio and they listened to weekend programs. They listened to nightly programs of different ideas and different stories. So the consumer economy, the roaring 20s, is blowing up. Okay? So, and this is for all of Western civilization. This is for Great Britain. This is for while the French weren't being very nice to women, neither were the Italians, but we're not getting into that right now. Uh, like, But the Western civilization, this is not just the United States. Do not just sit, sit there and be like, I thought that the Roaring Twenties were only for America. Sit down. Go live back under that rock. All right, so like, anyway, you got to understand, too, that everything is changing, though. Even art is changing. You saw two of the weirdest movements in all of art history, but they're two of my favorite ones. Now, the first two right here on your left are referred to as Dadaism. This is like getting into your abstract, non-representational art. Dadaism, jot this down real quick, is kind of the reaction of art to World War I. Nothing really truly has a meaning or sense because the world was so permanently broken by World War I. You've now got veterans who are absolutely having their lives destroyed, which we will talk about later. You've, you've got um, massive amounts of casualties, close to 40 million. The Spanish flu came through. It caused a pandemic worldwide that killed over 20 million. And so art reacted to it, and they were like, What's going on? So they just created this stuff, right? And Dadaism, this is the most famous piece of Dada art. That is a urinal. We're going to the bathroom in. But it's upside down. This is Dada right there. Dadaism is kind of like if I were just to take this football and then just like put my phone on, like, like. Call it whale. It's, this is whale, all right? Like, this is Dada, right? So, like, it's just, that, that's whale, all right? Now, anyway, and then you've got this, like, collage piece right here. Dadaism is extremely insane. But then it moved into surrealism. Surrealism kind of, like, was a little bit more of a reaction to the war itself as well. And it moved towards the ideas of getting some representation back in art, though, right? But surreal being of, like, the outside of the real realm. Surreal means, like, of beyond the realness. These two people pieces are both by the same guy. These are both by Salvador Dali. All right, so Salvador Dali, this one being his most famous one that is called the persistence of memory. All right, persistence of memory, trying to show the melting away of time. And he claims that he saw these things in his mind's eye sometimes when he was dreaming and trying to show like how just time's melting away on us and that the persistence of memory is only fleeting. And like, for example, you've got all these ants taking over this watch and this right here, not a horse. That's an eye. Look at the eyelashes right there and the nose. That's a human face face that's draped over that rock. And then this one, as y'all know, that one's in my classroom. I miss so much. All right, so that one's in my classroom. That is Geopoliticus and Child. This one is actually trying to show, because he liked to use a lot of egg representation, uh, this one is trying to show this is the United States emerging from World War I as a global powerhouse. So it's like kind of good perfectly relates to this whole Roaring Twenties aspect, right? The consumer economy, the new birth of women, the nah, 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 like all the cool stuff happening in the Twenties. Wasn't it awesome? Well, like, so yeah, to an extent, right? I mean, like, it was good because you know what? Like, people were living better lives. And this is also really quick, a subtle warning. Midway through the flip, okay? You are not going to understand any of this stuff for the final test. If you have me muted for any of this stuff, it is very apparent when y'all have me muted because you don't understand how to answer short answer questions and you end up losing a lot of points. So, getting more into it though. Technology is going to make factories much more efficient. This is going to add to this whole Roaring Twenties aspect because where did this Roaring Twenties aspect come from? Where did all this stuff happen? Why is it that all of a sudden factories start creating more things and more goods at cheaper rates and all this other stuff and all these booming tins, right? So, like, how come they start doing these things? I know, I love you too. Why are they doing this? What was making the consumer economy so much easier to access? A lot of it has to do with the fact that the economy is of many nations, not Germany, exploded during the 20s. We know that Germany's economy is not exploding during the 20s due to the fact that the Treaty of Versailles was very, very mean. All right, so, but we will get into that stuff a little bit later on when we talk about the rise of some of our dictators and things like that. But the assembly line is going to change the way that factories operate. Like, CEOs and business consultants are going to analyze the movement of factory workers to try and figure out ways 
for them to be structurally placed yeah. along the line of a factory to make and create goods at a faster rate without exerting as much effort. This right here, that is an assembly line worker at a car factory installing what looks to be a gas tank. Um, now, so as you can tell, the like assembly line is going to make things more efficient and it's going to create this consumer economy. It's going to make the fashions cheaper. It's going to make the like cinema easier to create. Well, actually, it doesn't really relate to cinema. It's going to make it easier to create radios at a faster pace. Why is my hair just sticking out like that? There it goes. All right, so now it's going to be the thing that provides the possibility. Factories are becoming more efficient. Then you're, since the factories are now becoming more efficient, now we're looking at a five day work week because since we have more workers, more employed, higher wages, the economy also learns to stimulate itself by re reducing itself to that five day work week. Here also again are some assembly line workers. These ones of course are all women, right? These female assembly line workers are actually in a factory. They're earning their own money, right? This is that image of our new 20s woman. I also like how this one like camera bomber is just staring right at the camera. Out of all of the girls in at Chappelle, I feel like that right there would be somebody like, I don't know, like like that's Caitlin Catalanata. She just can't not look at it, right? Like so, like so. That's a big thing. The five day work weeks come into play, and then also you've got with that since you've got five day work week. Now you got the weekends, right? The Roaring Twenties saw the rise of the weekend. You got leisure time. You got time to chill out. You got time to do a lot of nothing is what a lot of y'all like claim that you do. Oh, I sleep until noon. Get up. All right, so anyway, now leisure time, including like maybe you're going to commit yourself to a sports team. You're going to go start watching some amateur sports. Right here, right here is going to be like some of the rise of amateur football is going to have its roots in the 1920s. And then professional football is going to have its roots as well in the 1920s and the early 19th or in the early 1900s. And then you've got these youngins going off to a beach, right? You've got these guys going out on the town. They're going and having a good time on a Saturday night, right? They're going and enjoying that leisure time because factories have become more efficient, which gave us the five-day work week, which increased this idea that we can go and hang out and stimulate the economy further and keep adding to it, keep purchasing goods, purchasing ideas during this leisure amount of time. Now, as you can tell, the Roaring Twenties is pretty great, right? It's pretty great. It's pretty awesome. You had, like, the, the modern society you know of now was born in the 1920s, following World War I, with the growth of the the economies of the winning nations of World War One, particularly the United States, uh, Great Britain, and France, and then you gotta understand one other thing though, you're gonna get into other history classes. You're gonna talk about the Roaring Twenties and other history classes, and your teachers are gonna be like, "Oh, they're great and they're amazing, and look at this fun little video of the Charleston, like it's look how awesome it is." Some of you also need to understand in Western civilizations that the Roaring Twenties were not roaring for everyone, all right? So the Roaring Twenties is a term used to try and kind of create a big blanket statement over the idea that, oh, times were awesome. Times were awesome if you were a part of the national identity of your country. You understand what I'm saying? If you were in the middle class America, the Roaring Twenties were great. Upper class America, Roaring Twenties were great. But if you were... A Jewish person living in Europe, um, a minority living in parts of the United States, uh, or just like in general, a minority living in your country, times were still very hard for you, right? Like it, the Roaring Twenties were not roaring at all because you still had massive rates of anti-Semitism. You still had massive rates of racism. You still had massive rates of violence against minorities. Lynching was still not punishable by law in the 1920s. They attempted to get a bill through Congress in 1921 to outlaw lynching, which is the mob rule violence over another person in the United States of America, to go off and hang someone and execute them without them seeing their day in court. So, and then you had the rise of eugenics. Like this picture right here on the side is from the Tulsa race riot in like Oklahoma. A guy was being, uh, like, a, a bunch of townspeople tried to get this guy who was in prison for sexual assault. Turns out that he didn't do it. They tried to take him out of his cell to, like, lynch him or hang him. Several other members of the African-American community, they're like, whoa, slow down. What do you think you're doing? And then a fight broke out, and then it saw, like, a massive race riot in 1922. Like, you're talking about, like, 
things are still very tense. This Roaring Twenties moniker is not necessarily just like, oh, hey, look, everything was great. Because it really, I mean, like, it was great for you if you had the money for it to be great. It wasn't great if you were in Germany and you had no money whatsoever. It wasn't great if you were living in a, like, highly impoverished area. And then you had this thing on the rise, too. Eugenics, which is this thing that tried to support all these ideas. Eugenics was like this weird pseudoscience that popped up in the early 1900s hundreds that aimed at creating a genetically superior race by excluding people who are judged to be inferior, right? So you're talking about a science. They People believe this was a science. Now notice I have the word pseudoscience, right? And I have all these things in red because they're all terrible, awful things that are not representative of this whole Roaring Twenties era. The Roaring Twenties was only roaring if you had the money for it to be roaring, right? Or if you had the privilege of it to be roaring. So the eugenics aspect is the pseudoscience that supported all of these things. So pseudo means false, right? So if you have a pseudopod, that's like a clam, they have like a false foot, all right? So pseudo means false or not true. Another one is called phrenology, the study of the contours of the human skull and personality traits. That's not real either, all right? So pseudoscience, eugenics ain't real. It's not based in fact, but people just picked it up and kept spitting it like it was. So, and this idea was like, we're going to create a genetically superior society by excluding people from reproducing, right? That led to mass sterilization campaigns and places like the United Kingdom and in the United States. Later, this is going to justify the Holocaust for the, in the minds of the Nazis, which is the most messed up thing on the planet, and the exclusion of Jewish populations all over Europe, and it's going to be evidence to support racist activity. So as you can see, Roaring Twenties ain't roaring for everybody, all right? So going even further, though, it still ain't roaring for everybody, because what about imperialism? Is that still a thing? Um, yeah, it is, all right? Like, imperialism didn't just vanish, right? It's still there. Industrialism was just changing its face, right? It was taking this imperialized world, this imperialized idea of Africa being completely controlled by Europeans and, like, all these other member countries, and it was just changing the way imperialism looked. Industrialism, in instead of going to Africa to get raw materials, to bring them back, to process them in your factories, imper industrialization just grew at such a rapid rate that it changed everything. And these big multinational corporations popped up where companies were not only had offices in Europe, they now had offices in Latin America, Africa, and Europe, right? And they would base the factories in their imperial areas. So you still had the French West African area, but now French West Africa, instead of taking the raw materials from French West Africa and sending it to France for it to be made, factories just went to Africa instead. They just started popping them up there. And so you've got this really, really messed up thing. And why do you want to put factories up in your imperial colonies? Because those people will make goods for cheaper. All right. So like, and that is just kind of economic like imperialism in and of a sense. So like the empire idea is still there. So this is not a roaring 20s for the people of Africa, India, Southeast Asia. This is not good for them. They're not seeing economic expansion. And some people are calling for a dramatic end to imperialism. Most of those people happen to be nationalists from their area. The most famous one out of all of them, Mohandas Gandhi. Love this guy. He is the man. All right. So now I like to take two seconds to be like, look, I know I've been talking this whole time about the Roaring Twenties is only is great, and then I kind of hit you with a punch, and I'm like, not if you're not in the middle class or higher, and then I'm like, and imperialism's still there. Well, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a glimmer of hope. I'm going to bring you back down again here in a second, but I'm trying to give you a glimmer of hope and be like, look, there were some great people that popped up, and they tried to fight for the rights of people, and one of them happens to be your boy Mohandas Gandhi, later referred to as Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma being Sanskrit for great soul. All right, and my little roofy doofy over here is a great soul only if he stops licking his feet. Now, anyway, stop it. Don't do it. I just saw you do it. All right, so Mahatma Gandhi, this being him as a young man when he was living in South Africa, and this being him when he actually moved back to India in his 40s, uh, you have to understand his early work. That's where it began. So he is from India originally. He is from India, born in the 1800s in India and the mid-1800s. I think it's... Are you hiding under the bed? All right, so anyway... He just doesn't like that this is like all not nice and stuff, but it happens. So his early work, though, began in South Africa because he tried to create a law practice in India, and it turns out that it wasn't going as well as he would hoped. So he was hired by an Indian client in South Africa. 
He goes there to try and help out and has a crazy intense experience. He's riding a railway car in South Africa when a white person gets on and tells him to get up and move to the car in the back that is for colored people. And he refuses to do that, right? And so he actually begins, from that moment on, a civil rights campaign in South Africa based on civil disobedience and pacifism. Pacifism. Pacifism, all right? Now, civil disobedience being purposefully not following laws that are marginalizing or infringing upon the rights of minorities, right? Like, for example, if they were told they weren't allowed to go to a certain place, they would just go there, right? Now, pacifism, though, is what he used to try and use nonviolent tactics. Pacifism includes sit-ins, nonviolent protests, uh, striking a lot, or boycotts. Boycotts is a form of pacifism, and that's what he did. And now later on, after he tries to do as much work as he can in South Africa, he returns to India during World War I to campaign for things like easing poverty levels in India, outlawing untouchability. Remember when we talked about imperialism in India a while back, and I told you that the lowest area of the caste system were, of course, the Dalits, the untouchables at the very, very bottom? And I'm actually talking about all this stuff right beneath my elephant bells right there that are actually from India. And he wanted to uh, outlaw that idea of the caste system and the untouchability, that this like that their religion supported a class that was so low that they had to live in segregated areas, right? So he wanted to expand the rights of women. He wanted self-rule for India as well. He wanted India to be ruled by Indians. He wanted self-determination for them. And he also wanted religious and ethnic amity, which is actually the positive relationship between the two of them. And so he is going to do this by using things like hunger strikes. He's going to do the salt march in 1930 when the British had this giant excise tax on salt and forced the Indians to buy only British packaged salt. Kind of like with the Boston Tea Party. Remember the Boston Tea Party? Remember when they were forced to buy tea from Britain? Mohandas Gandhi took a page out of their book, sort of, and decides to create his own salt. So he has, leads the Salt March in 1930 to prevent buying salt from the British. And so he walks a giant group of Indian people to the ocean where they bring with them pans where they were going to scoop up seawater and then allow the water to evaporate in the pan, leaving behind the salt on the inside. And this was considered a massive like insult by the British, and they start using violence to quell his pacifist protest, and he starts boycotting British goods, uh, like actually vying for homespun clothing instead of the cheap textiles coming out of factories in Great Britain. And eventually he actually ends up winning his campaign, and in, um, India earns itself self-rule in 1947, after World War II. However, Gandhi, unfortunately, will be assassinated after India gets self-rule. He gets shot three times in the chest by a Hindu uh, extremist. So, But he's just an amazing story, and it's really awesome to take two seconds to talk about someone in those imperial areas that was standing up for themselves, and they were being like, look, we deserve to be our own countries. So like a lot of these movements started with people like Mahatma Gandhi, right? So he's an amazing figure. And in the description down below, I'm going to leave a couple, like a little biography video about him. If you want to learn a little bit more about him, super, super awesome. Uh, so take that chance to do that. And then also not to mention the fact that, yes, now I'm pulling you back down again a little bit. I know some of you are all like, wow, we've just been talking about how the world's racist for like a long time. And like, well, yeah, it was, you know, I mean, like there's nothing we can do about it. Um, now, like, like in the 1920s, I'm not talking about now. So the true casualties, though, the true casualties of World War One in the purest sense are the actual casualties of World War One. Let's talk about what a casualty is. A casualty is a person who is killed or injured in a war or an accident, right? Notice injured, right? Injured is a key word right there. A lot of people just refer to a casualty as being only someone who dies in a war. It's not so. It's not so. Somebody who is permanently injured by a war is also considered a casualty, all right? So, a lot of World War veterans returned home to disfigured, disjointed, and destroyed lives, right? Shell shock was a massive occurrence, the earliest known cases of what we now call PTSD. Shell shock was called shell shock due to the fact that loud noises could trigger um, psychotic, or not psychotic, but um, like psychoactive episodes in soldiers, causing them to have flashes to the front lines or the in, the inability to move. Some of the most ridiculous cases of shell shock show videos of men unable to walk or 
function and it requires a lot of mental health treatment. And so the first cases of shell shock or PTSD were discovered after World War I. And then you also had millions of veterans returning home who were permanently disfigured from this war. This man lost an eye. This is a group of men learning how to walk again with the absence of their legs. This is a World War I veteran begging for money after he lost his leg as well. So as you can tell, veteran affairs are still something that we have been struggling with for almost a hundred years, right? So it is something to always be mindful of because that was a true casualty of World War I. And just to give you again, a little glimmer of hope, just a glimmer, just a touch, just a little, just a small bit of hope. And I know some of you are like, well, this doesn't look hopeful at all. Like this woman, this is not the woman, this is a veteran that she helped. A woman, Anna Coleman Ladd happens to be another very, very promising figure of this post-World War II era. Anna Coleman Ladd was an American sculptor and an American philanthropist who sought to try and help a lot of the injured veterans from World War I. And she pioneered some of the earliest forms of what you would now refer to as plastic surgery. Now, of course, she wasn't surgically operating on these figures or on these men. She was creating for them prosthetics to wear on their faces or on their bodies to try and be able to live a more normal life. This is a man that she helped down here at the bottom who was permanently disfigured by an explosion, an artillery shell explosion, explosion. so she made him a mask that was perfectly blended in with his facial tone for him to be able to wear out in public so he could actually feel like he was like living a normal life again. So Anna Coleman Ladd happens to be one of my favorite figures from this entire area, and I think she's just kind of like a nice little glimmer of hope. She's like an idea that like, you know what, you know, like we can learn from her to keep helping our veterans as much as possible. Now, many of these veterans are going to attempt to re-enter the post-industrial economy. However, many couldn't, while women are going to be the ones that replace them in a lot of these jobs in a lot of these areas. However, the economy boomed without them which is a terrifying aspect of war's truest casualties. The men left behind by their countries who tried, who were willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for it, right? So you've got this aspect of the Roaring Twenties, right? You've got this aspect of it kind of being good and bad all at the same time, right? Now, now we got to get into, though, how all these things are then going to lead to the rise of these really, 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 really intense, really, really, really scary, really freaky figures in history, right? Now, booming economies were great, but they were only truly valid if you were one of the big three, all right? The big three being France, Great Britain, and the United States, all right? So the United States of America happens to be one of those big three, right? So France and Great Britain as well. If you're one of the losers of the war, though, not so much. You're not going through roaring 20s at all. You're going through terrible 20s like everybody else is, right? So the worst, though, out of all of them being Italy and Germany. Now, Italy was promised territorial, territorial gains after World War I. However, they did not receive them in the Treaty of Versailles. And then after World War I, a lot of uh, like post-industrial aspects of Italy are going to be shut and they're going to see the closing of a lot of different economic areas due to things like hyperinflation, high unemployment, failing businesses, fractured masculinity, and savings being destroyed. Now, we're going to get into fractured masculinity a lot more later on, but just to give you a taste of what that is, in places like Italy and Germany, you had hyperinflation at an all-time high, right? Money being basically worthless. Like, look at this right here. This is an Austrian banknote known as a crown. That was their original uh, form of uh, <coughs> currency. This is a 500,000 banknote for a crown. That's how much their money had inflated. Nobody walks around with $500,000 bills, all right? Like, that's how much their money inflated. Now, think about this for a minute. If you had savings before the war, if you were like, oh, my wife and I, we have been working for 20 years, we have saved up 100,000 crowns, and then hyperinflation hits, that 100,000 crowns that you saved for 20 years is now worth nothing, all right? So that is now completely gone. So the hard work of these men, of this household, is now gone. Then you got high unemployment, so men are losing their jobs. You got failing businesses, so men are losing their businesses. That is leading to this idea of fractured masculinity. 
Because remember, in the 1920s, it was still expected by a lot of different families in a lot of different areas that the men were supposed to be these providing figures, right? This is going to lead to a massive disjoint in a lot of these areas. So in Italy and Germany, men were angry and they were looking for someone to blame after this war. They were like, I would almost died in that war. I might have lost a limb. I can't like provide for my family anymore. The savings I had is now worthless. What am I supposed to do? So you saw the rise of totalitarian governments, right? Rise of totalitarianism. So we got to talk about what totalitarianism is. All right, so totalitarian, to, that's a mouthful, right? Say it with me real quick. Totalitarianism. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Tarianism. Now, anyway, really, really quick though, what totalitarianism is, you're going to see a rise of it in these really, really fractured, destroyed countries like Italy and Germany with their high unemployment rates, their hyperinflation, their fractured masculinity. It's going to start rising up. And what that is, is when a government seeks total control over the lives of its citizens through the use of a centralized dictatorship right? So in your mind, you're thinking of, uh, like, immediately what comes to mind is one figure that we're about to talk about in about two seconds, right? But, what, like, this is a very key concept. A government that seeks total control over the lives of its citizens through the use of a centralized dictatorship. Now, in Europe, you've got the rise of two different types of totalitarian government, right? The first one that we're going to talk about being fascist dictators hiding behind this idea of socialism. And then we're going to talk about communist dictators here in a second. Or do it. Yeah, so let's talk about fascism first. <gasps> what is that? A facies. Bet you ain't seen that thing in a hot minute. That facies right there, oh, hearkening all the way back to Rome when we used to talk about it, is where the word fascism gets its name, okay? Fascism as in the immediate and obedient control and obedience to the state, right? Fascism coming from the word fasc like facies of the ancient Roman Empire is a far-right, ultra-nationalist character characterized by forcible suppression of an opposition, okay? It is strict obedience to the state, and it is this idea that anybody who is not with you is against you, and they will be forcibly removed. So it's characterized by violence, ultra-nationalism to the point of trying to get rid of or push out foreign influence. And the biggest ones that you know of, this one being the one that rose up first that not a lot of people realize that you will actually be doing a very good project about. You can go ahead and start looking up some information on him before you start doing your project. That is Benito Mussolini, who started the Italian fascist party. Okay, Benito Mussolini, B-E-N-I-T-O, M-U-S-S-O-L-I-N-I, -S -S -I -I, Benito Mussolini, who is a very important figure from this unit, and he started the Italian Fascist Party. Now, originally started out as a socialist, though. Let's talk about that for real quick. Let's reel it on back in. These fascist dictators, a lot of times, would hide behind the term socialism, but they're not actually socialists. Like, for example, the word Nazi stands for National Socialist, all right? Not actually a socialist, though. The main reason why they called themselves socialists is because the people they were targeting. They wanted support from working class men. What are working class men usually going to be more apropos to? Socialist ideas, right? So, especially during this time period. Socialism, of course, being the ideas, the welcoming ideas of providing for your community, getting your share, or promising uh, accident insurance and or social welfare programs. So this was a sense that they used it, the term socialism, when they were actually fascist to take control of their countries. So as you can tell, Mussolini is also obsessed with bringing about the old Rome, right, being from Italy. So he even sounds like a piece of pasta, Benito Mussolini. All right, so now, then you've got, ugh, like this tool bag, Adolf Hitler, right? Adolf Hitler being your other fascist dictator. Now, Hitler, of course, bringing about the rise of the Nazi party, his far-right, ultra-nationalist, characterized, characterized by forcible suppression of the opposition government known as the Nationalist Socialist Party, the Nazi party. Now, I don't like his face, and I don't like his symbol, so I'm going to cover him up with a rainbow, because I he's dead, and like, you know what, take that, nerd. And then also, he's got a little crybaby face, and we're just going to put that over his face, because I don't like him, all right? I don't like him, I don't want to look at him, I don't like that symbol, I don't like it, all right? So even though he stole it from the Buddhists, don't even get me started on that. It's actually a Buddhist symbol that he appropriated for his party, 
All right, anyway, now, then you got communist dictators, okay? Your communist dictator, your big communist dictator being that of Joseph Stalin, all right? So Joseph Stalin, J-O-S-E-P-H, S-T-A-L-L-I-N, Joseph Stalin, all right? So Joseph Stalin, not his real name. His real name is Losef Dajgajvile, all right? He's actually from Georgia. Not Georgia like Atlanta, Georgia, but Georgia as in Georgia the country in Eastern Europe, all right? So he's Losef over here, not his real, or that's his real name. Joseph Stalin, though, named himself that after someone called him the Man of Steel, which is what Stalin means in German. Stalin, all right, so a man of steel. So he was like, ooh, I like that name. And he changed his name to Joseph Stalin. But he becomes the communist dictator after Lenin dies, all right? So now we could get into an entire debacle about the rise of Stalin and the death of Trotsky, which uh, the academic girls, you're gonna actually have that on one of your little like timeline assignments that you're doing for your project. But just so you know, Communist dictator, fascist dictator, two completely different things, all right? But they're both totalitarians, okay? So it's kind of like the idea that not all squares are rectangles, but all, wait, not all, wait, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares? You understand what I'm saying? So Stalin's a little bit different. He's not far right. He's not ultra-nationalist. He is not characterized by forcible suppression. He is not related back to our old faces right here. His symbol of being a communist is right here in that sickle and hammer. Communism, of course, being the idea of the collectivization of the means of production production, and the elimination or prevention of economic elites, right? Even though, ironically enough, there were still tons of economic elites in Russia under his tutelage. Now, then you've got one other guy that comes up later, and then there's Franco. Look at Franco. Francisco Franco. Well, we're not going to worry about Franco, all right? So Franco is the dictator from, he's a Francoist. Uh, he's like a totalitarian dictator from Spain, but we're not going to get too much into him, okay? So, and then you got 1929. And what happened in 1929, Mr. Terry? This is the class you should be taking if you don't know what happened in 19, 1929. It's called How to Stop Living Under a Rock. You should know exactly what happened in 1929. In 1929, the greatest stock market crash of all of history happened in the United States of America on Black Tuesday on October 29th, 1929. So some of y'all immediately are going to be saying to yourself, but Mr. Terry, I thought that only affected America. No, you have to understand that it affected everybody. It affected all of Western civilizations due to the fact, why did this happen? Mainly because of this idea of playing the market. Americans have become obsessed with credit. All right, so what you got to understand what credit is, credit is borrowing money you don't have. Kind of like a loan, but a little bit different, all right? Credit usually has a much higher interest rate. And you have to understand is that the stock market, emblemized by this stock graph right here, was actually at a very high rate in the 1920s. Because the 1920s were what? They were roaring, right? Since the 1920s are roaring and these middle class families had all of this credit and they had all this money to spend, they started playing the stock market. When you play the stock market and you invest in the economy, the economy goes up. And so when you buy a stock, you're buying a share of a business, okay? The problem was, what happened in October? Skookookaboosh, right? It just comes flying down. Now you owe this money that you just borrowed that has a high interest rate. So where did everybody go? To the bank to withdraw their money. But where was their money? It's gone, all right? So your money is gone because what does a bank do with your money when you give them your money? They spend it on their bills, right? They don't keep money on hand. They use it. So... Remember the Medici's? Yeah. If everybody shows up at a bank to withdraw their money all at the same time, the bank will have to shut because it doesn't have the money to provide all of its like investors back with their cash. So whoop, 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 whoop. let's get back to where I was. All right. So then remember the Medici's? What happens though when you don't have money to give out and these banks are going to deflate and close and crash? Now we're going into the great... Depression, all right? So, attached to your Google Classrooms are the large base assignments that you have coming up. You have an essay for honors, a DBQ style essay, five paragraph research paper, and then also my academic girls, y'all have a timeline assignment that will be attached in your assignments portion. It has the due date, the outline, and everything entailed before, in total entailed for it. And we will start right here with our next, uh, what you call it, Next flip, we talk about the effects of the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 1929 on the whole entirety of Western civilization. Okay, so I'll talk to you guys about that soon. Y'all have a good one. I love how y'all are getting into this already, but keep it real, all right? I'll see y'all later.